Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Our speaker this evening studied the Catholic liberal arts at Thomas Aquinas College in California, graduating in 2002. A native of Ottawa, Sean Fitzpatrick is currently the assistant headmaster and a teacher at his other alma mater, Gregory the Great Academy in Pennsylvania, a boarding school for boys offering the classical liberal arts education in the Catholic tradition, one that uh, is fully lived and not just studied in the classroom. I have a lot of uh, good friends who, who uh, studied with uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick at Gregory the Great. It's a wonderful school. At the academy, he teaches literature, humanities, and drama and uh, leads the boys in many other, uh, he might say tonight, quixotic enterprises to discover the true, the good, and the beautiful in contrast to what is on offer by our society today. His writings on education, literature, and culture have appeared in a number of journals, including Crisis Magazine, Catholic World Report, The Epoch Times, and The Imaginative Conservative. Sean lives in Scranton with his wife, Sophie, and their seven children. Please welcome to the ICC for the first time, Sean Fitzpatrick. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Father, and thank you, Peter, for that, uh, that very kind introduction, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I am so grateful to be here this evening, uh, grateful to the Institute for inviting me to give this webinar, and uh, well, this is my first webinar, so... I hope you'll forgive me if anything weird happens, okay? You, you, it um, looks good from our end. <laughs> okay. My purpose tonight um, is to propose that great literary creation of Miguel de Cervantes, Don Quixote, as a fitting yet often forgotten symbol of the Catholic warrior. And I'm happy to propose that because, well, I think he is. I think that's exactly what he is. Uh, I've had several times, though, when I've mentioned this idea of Don Quixote being a Catholic standard to others, uh, you know, people who I thought were my friends, um, and I was met with, uh, you know, wide eyes or, or, or wrinkled noses <laughs> uh, and asked whether I think that a crazy idiot uh, who is stuck in the past and who doesn't see reality as it is and is constantly making a fool of himself is a good Catholic example. You know, it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> well, if you put it that way. <laughs> but and I guess, you know, they have a point there, uh, I suppose. But I think in choosing that point, they miss out on another and a far greater point, the point that God often takes what seems foolish or futile and makes it by his grace the exact opposite. So, to speak broadly, The Adventures of Don Quixote is a book about failure. It's about a lot of other things as well, but it is largely about failure. It's also about the proper attitude towards failure and what is defined as failure, uh, both of which, uh, of course, are measures of the Catholic life. As Catholics, we are always concerned about failures and rejoice in the ways that our Lord has redeemed us from our failures. But that involves having perseverance in the face of failure and having faith even when we are branded as failures by those who do not share a vision of the truth. Another way of putting it, the way you look at things changes everything, especially failure. And that point of view is precisely the point of the adventures of Don Quixote. So, a bit about the book. It was written in two parts by Miguel de Cervantes, the first published in 1605 when he was 58 years old, and the second part written and published or completed 10 years later in 1615, uh, which was a year before he died. And it cannot be denied that this novel, 
considered, by the way, the first novel of what we now know as the novel, uh, but more on that a little bit later. Uh, it cannot be denied that this novel, though full of wonderful adventures and uproarious humor and magnificent idealism, is a story of failure. Repeated, discouraging, <laughs> humiliating failure. Nevertheless, there are perspectives that render the story of Don Quixote anything but a failure. For those who aren't familiar with the premise, it's pretty simple. Don Quixote, a gentleman of minor gentry from La Mancha, a totally insignificant place in Spain, loved books of chivalry so much he locked himself up in his library where he spent the nights reading from twilight till daybreak and the days from dawn till dark, <laughs> reading all the time, all night, all day. And so from little sleep and much reading, his brains dried up and he lost his wits. <laughs> to take the place of his wits, he filled up his mind with all that he read in his books, everything, with enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, torments, and, and all that other impossible nonsense. Um, and so deeply did he steep his imagination in the belief that all the fanciful stuff that he read was true, that to his mind, no history in the world was more authentic. And I'll read you a little section from the novel here to tell you what it is that he decided to do. In fact, now that he had utterly wrecked his reason, he fell into the strangest fancy that ever a madman had in the whole world. He thought it fit and proper, both in order to increase his renown and to serve the state, to turn knight errant and travel through the world with horse and armor in search of adventures, following in every way the practice of the knights errant he had read of, redressing all manner of wrongs and exposing himself to chances and dangers by the overcoming of which he might win eternal honor and renown. Already the poor man fancied himself crowned by the valor of his arm, at least with the empire of Trebizond. And so, carried away by the strange pleasure he derived from these agreeable thoughts, he hastened to translate his desires into action. So, Don Quixote dons ancient armor, mounts his gaunt, skinny horse, Rocinante, and sallies forth across the dusty plains of Castile with his squire, in fact, his neighbor, Sancho Panza, to pursue all that he has perused, to live out what he has loved, and revive the glorious era of knighthood and a forgotten code of armor, dedicating all of his heroic deeds to his imagined lady, the beauteous Dulcinea del Toboso. It's, it's just great. <laughs> it's fantastic. Don Quixote is absolutely insane and absolutely sublime. His actions are outrageous. His speech is exquisite. His intentions are pure. His successes, well, you know, they're, they're few and far between. But you can begin to see a kind of dichotomy that this book sets up for us. Beyond his village, this self-dubbed knight errant trips headlong into Renaissance Spain with grand visions of things gone completely out of style. He goes in quest of knights, wizards, giants, ladies, kings, and castles, but the road carries him to hard knocks and harder realities. Don Quixote, Quixote only finds rogues, goat herds, windmills, convicts, chambermaids, and inns. He mistakes sheep for soldiers, hovels for citadels, 
and a battered barber's basin in <laughs> for the golden helmet of Mambrino. Again and again, Don Quixote's morals are denied, his manners ridiculed, and his purposes foiled. The Knight of the Sorrowful Face, as he is called by his witty and long-suffering squire, is beaten and bruised at nearly every turning as he upholds the truth of chivalric and Catholic virtue. Don Quixote has got to be the funniest book in the world for all of his mishaps. But at the same time, speaking of that dichotomy, it has moments of transcendence. A great example of this is when Don Quixote arrives at a rundown inn, he mistakes for a castle, and he encounters a couple ladies uh, of easy virtue, as Cervantes calls them. But seeing them as high-born ladies, he speaks to them by the book in the most genteel terms imaginable. Of course, the girls burst out laughing. Uh, they are the furthest thing from being fair maidens or noblewomen, but Don Quixote won't let it go. And before we know it, their scornful laughter disappears, and they begin to attend upon this old loony knight, as princesses might using kind and gentle words, doing their best to make him comfortable, as though they honored him as the knight that he purports to be. It's really, it's a lovely moment. And it's one that happens again and again in the novel. And it's an example of how the story turns the tables on you. At one moment, you yourself are laughing at this ridiculous figure. And at the next, you're moved as Don Quixote elevates the lowly with his lofty visions of beauty, giving an unforeseen grace and purpose to what seems at first glance to be lunacy, but has something of a beautiful truth about it. And this is one of the reasons why Don Quixote is a Catholic book and one that all Catholics should dust off and read, whether again, or for the first time. Our faith teaches us that everything we find in this life, no matter how base, should be regarded as having a place in the hands of God. Don Quixote may be crazy, but he sees and speaks something true in his high principles that lead people upward, even for a moment. In this way, Don Quixote is victorious in his failure or at least unconquered, because he, reflect, he, refuses, he refuses to surrender the beauty of his vision, the truth of his ideas, and the goodness of his determination to pursue and protect these things as best as he can, even if he isn't the most effective knight you've ever seen. Impossible dreams of grandeur may seem crazy, and such ideals and their upholders do not easily fit in to a world where the good, true, and beautiful have been abandoned or worse, denied. <laughs> and sometimes it takes the determination of a madman or a seeming madman to lead people out of that blindness and towards sharing a vision of the divine and our own participation in the divine. So perhaps you can begin to share uh, my vision of why the wacky hero of this novel succeeds in striking a unique Catholic example, even as a failure. Of course, the Catholic faith is not about failure. Uh, the faith is about quite the opposite, of course, even though it deals with failure and the consequences of failure all the time. We are absolutely used to identifying it at least with the image of failure, and that is the cross. But there is more to the cross than just an image of worldly failure. Christ turned the cross to unspeakable glory, and that is the seeming foolishness of the cross. Now, it's interesting. Um, what is thought by some to be the earliest known artistic rendition of the crucifixion 
is a piece of graffiti. And I think uh, Peter has a slide of it for all of us. Um, this image that dates from the third century was discovered in Rome in 1857. And it's a drawing scratched into a plaster wall depicting a man, as you can see, raising his hand in salute before a crucified figure with a donkey's head. And it's pretty striking. It's, it, it's even shocking. Below the man it is scrawled in Greek the words, Alexemenos worships his God. Alexemenos worships his God. Now, this vandalism, of course, intended to mock Christianity. But ironically, it encapsulates what few works of Christian art have captured, at least in my opinion and experience. Um, or at least it gets at an aspect of the cross that I think has been lost to cultures where executions like crucifixion are not normal. Uh, and that is the ignominy of the cross. The shame, the embarrassment, the ridicule of the cross. We're all accustomed to thinking of the cross or thinking of the, the suffering of the cross and, and the pain and the sacrifice, even the derision of the, the crown of thorns. But not everyone really connects with the fact that the cross was a death for a fool, an ass. Don Quixote stands as a perfect icon of the Catholic paradox of making an ass of yourself in the name of ideals and principles and realities, a religion that the world thinks only madmen devote themselves to. We all know that truly mad modern attitude of blind, indifferent ignorance about the invisible side of creation, those things that can be understood and seen through the things God has made ideals that are meaningful in themselves and whose recognition often sparks an attitude of inspiration and aspiration, which often makes the quest of Catholicism, well, quixotic. We all know instances of such quixotry too, such acts of faith. Many stories from scripture and the lives of the saints have a quality that defies simple understanding or that border on a sublime absurdity that flies in the face of what you might call normal human reasoning, like the image of the cross. Many of these are so familiar, it's easy to overlook the enormous peculiarities that they possess. Let's take, for example, one we all know. Uh, we all know the story of Jesus walking on the stormy sea towards his disciples. And Peter asks, if he might come to him over the water. Just think about that. You know, it's here that our familiarity with the story might make us overlook the outlandish nature of Peter's request. <laughs> what man in his right mind could hope to accomplish such a feat? And, and why would he even wish to do it? But at a word from Christ, Peter jumped over the side of the boat in what must have seemed to the other disciples as an act of total lunacy. And he walked on the waves with God until he started to sink, of course, <laughs> you know, glorious failure. And what makes Don Quixote a glorious book, even in its theme of failure, lies in its resilient optimism. And the life of Miguel de Cervantes is full of this quality. That is a cheerful, driven disposition despite miserable failure. Cervantes was a devout Catholic, to be sure. And a look at his life sheds light on the unmistakable Catholic spirit of the novel that he gave to us. Cervantes was born in 1547 in Alcala, and he was the son of a surgeon, which was not as distinguished as it sounds. You know, back then, uh, being a surgeon uh, meant, besides taking a stab at what was wrong with your insides, he could also do your dental work and, and maybe give you a haircut. Uh, but, and what's more about Cervantes's father, Rodrigo, he was always packing up the family and going from town to town, uh, 
fleeing <laughs> from unhappy patients and unhappy creditors. He wasn't very good at his job. Uh, and so because of his father's failures, Cervantes was introduced to the roads of Spain at an early age and, and all the mishaps and miscreants uh, one can meet there. Cervantes began his literary career in 1568 as a young man of 21, determined to become one of the glorious poets in that golden age of poetry that was flourishing in Spain at that time. Uh, but everything he wrote, everything he wrote was dismissed or ignored. He never got any recognition for anything. Uh, even when he took on ambitious uh, and popular nationalist subjects, such as the verses he composed for the death of Elizabeth of Valois, the third wife of King Philip II, he had no success, no acknowledgement. He was a total failure as a poet, but not for lack of trying. Um, then at 22, he was defeated in a duel. And in shame, he up and went to Rome. And there he took a low level position for Cardinal uh, Giulio Acquaviva. But then with the threat of Islam growing over Europe, Pope Pius V formed the Holy League and the Christian world gathered under the military leadership of Don John of Austria to resist the Muslim invasion. Cervantes dropped everything and signed up. October 7, 1571, saw him aboard one of the galleys on the Bay of Patras for the Battle of Lepanto. But before the battle broke, Cervantes was sick as a dog and ordered to remain below by his commanding officer. But when the ships of the Holy League clashed with the ships of the Ottoman Empire and the cry of unimaginable victory began to sound, Cervantes, burst from below and landed fully armed upon the deck where he was immediately shot twice in the chest while a cannonball sailed away with his left hand. You know, for the glory of the right, he used to say. You know, he was a total failure as a soldier. Uh, but again, not for lack of trying. Turning back to Spain after that historical victory, Cervantes was looking forward to a hero's return. And it's true that the men who fought at Lepanto were welcomed home with favors, employment, uh, financial and official uh, patronage. Uh, but guess what happened to Cervantes? <laughs> On his way home, he was kidnapped by pirates and hauled off to Algiers and sold as a slave. And he was held there for five years after, and after many failed escape attempts. He was ransomed off by Trinitarian priests, and finally, he made it back to Spain, a penniless beggar. <laughs> and when he told people, I fought at Lepanto, <laughs> that line was pretty overworn by then. And people said, oh, yeah, that's what they all say. And they showed Cervantes the door without the honor due to him. <laughs> and so he then turned to writing plays and little uh, dramatic interludes. But like his poetry, it all basically came to nothing. He was a failure yet again. Cervantes then became a supply commissioner for the Spanish Armada for their intended invasion of England to suppress the Protestantism that was spreading there under Queen Elizabeth at the time. But that military endeavor didn't meet with much success and Cervantes was out of a job again. So he tried his hand, you know, his one hand at being a merchant and entered the wheat business. But <laughs> this is great, you know, due to some sort of improper transaction, uh, which seems by, by, by the scant accounts of it, you know, uh, to be a, a total misunderstanding, Cervantes ended up in jail. After getting out, he became a tax collector in Granada and was appointed to go around and collect back taxes from people in arrears. Uh, apparently he did a fine job he collected all the money that was due, put it in a bank, and gave his report to the officials. But when the officials went to collect the money from the bank, they found that the place had gone bankrupt, and the money was gone, and Cervantes went to jail again. <laughs> he, he began writing Don Quixote during this second imprisonment. And you can see that he had plenty of inspiration from his own life to create this 
this crazy tale of a hopeful hero who repeatedly gets beaten, uh, bruised, broken ribs, and is met with failure upon failure. But like Don Quixote, Cervantes was always known to pick himself up, dust himself off, and like his joke about losing his left hand for the glory of the right, he always had a positive attitude uh, in the midst of all his failures. Uh, even though his life and therefore his novel is fraught with failure, Cervantes makes clear a principle of life and, and certainly of his own life that life is full of failure since we are fallen creatures. And whether life is tolerable or not, whether it is redeeming or not, lies entirely in how we bear up beneath our cross with an unfailing optimism and a pious purpose. Anyway, when Don Quixote was published in 1605, it was <laughs> very well received. <laughs> At last, Cervantes finally got some accolades for something that he had done. People love the book, and we'll get into some of the reasons why uh, shortly. Ten years after Don Quixote was released, Cervantes completed the sequel of the novel, and part two came out in 1615. And it was in every way funnier and, and more exciting and more profound than the original. But <laughs> what is incredible? Uh, about the whole thing, and, and completely typical, is that the year before part two was finished, a writer named Alonso Fernandez de Avellaneda published his own sequel to Don Quixote called El Quixote, and everybody hated it because it was terrible. And so when the real sequel came out from Cervantes, people thought they had already read it, been disappointed, and, and they largely ignored Cervantes' glorious conclusion to the adventures of Don Quixote. <laughs> but he, on top of that, Cervantes was aware, as he was writing, of this guy jumping the gun on his sequel. And so in his part two, Cervantes made Don Quixote refer all the time to the imposter in Avellaneda's book condemning him, you know, the fake Quixote, that is, while praising himself as though he had read, you know, Cervantes as part one of his own history, you know, <laughs> the real Quixote of part one. And, and here's where you can see not only the, uh, the cheeky humor of Cervantes, but also some of these inside jokes uh, that make Don Quixote a real riot. Um, Shortly after joining the uh, Congregation of the Slaves of the Blessed Sacrament, Cervantes died with a happy, resigned spirit on April 23rd, 1616. And that's the same day that Shakespeare died, as Providence would have it. He received last rites and passed to everlasting life with, we hope, a greater glory than he ever found in his mortal life. Uh, a wonderful life, a wonderful life by all accounts that produced a wonderful book. So now let's look at some of the reasons why Don Quixote was so beloved in its day and remains uh, a book that is ranked among the greatest literary works of all time. Don Quixote as a piece of fiction was the first of its kind in many ways. Um, in Cervantes' time, People devoured volumes of fantastic, far-fetched romances of whatever remained from the Spanish chivalric age. And these books were generally filled with outlandish ad adventures, stock characters, monsters, supernatural beings, wild passions, uh, sentimentalism, violence, and all the rest of this stuff that we may associate with fairy tales, but in quality, and content, they were very much more like uh, Harlequin romance novels. Um, and the more they were read, especially with the dawn of the printing press, the sillier and more lascivious and exaggerated these books became. Now, <laughs> these are not only the books that Cervantes parodies and condemns as trash by making Don Quixote go mad over them, but he also transports his novel out of that fantasy realm 
and into the real world. In doing this, Cervantes gave people what they had never seen in a work of prose fiction, real people and real places with all the dust, hardship, weakness, inconvenience, common problems, body humor. In short, Cervantes gave them a world that was totally recognizable instead of the overblown fantasy they were used to and people loved it. They loved to see themselves in the pages of Don Quixote, even as it satirized them. Readers also loved the innovation of narrative dialogue, which Cervantes introduced. And the day-to-day -day details in storytelling that recreated a point in time was totally revolutionary. With Don Quixote, the novel was born and readers were carried away by both the recognizable world and the otherworldly idealism that made Don Quixote absolutely nuts and absolutely beloved. Now, there's a, there's a bait and switch going on here that you may be seeing. Cervantes was attacking those books that people wasted their time and money on. But at the same time, he uses their fancifulness to express an idealism that is beautiful and ennobling, even if it has trouble being accepted in this world. But of course, any such inconsistencies <laughs> or contradictions that you may find in the book, and you know, and there are several, uh, by the way, especially regarding Sancho's donkey, uh, who keeps appearing and disappearing from chapter to chapter. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you will have trouble getting around the security systems that Cervantes has worked into Don Quixote. Because you see, he, he makes the imagined authorship of his book very uncertain from the beginning, with an unreliable narrator that is very unsure of the facts of the case of the man from La Mancha. Add to that bits and pieces being found by a certain Sid Hamete Benengeli, and on top of that, many mistakes of translation attributed to various translators being avowed throughout. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. And honestly, you can drive yourself a little crazy trying to unravel all the weird and wacky threads that Cervantes has playfully woven through this tale of madness and magnificence. In any case, what are we to make of all this madness? If Don Quixote is about the seeming failure of reason, and I say seeming, although, you know, I do think he's pretty cracked, how is that in any way compatible or applicable to the Catholic life? What are we to draw from this madman whose madness is of such a kind that he speaks profound truths in mundane circumstances. Let's consider the most famous scene in the whole book. I will read it to you, or a section of it. At that moment, they caught sight of some 30 or 40 windmills which stand on that plain. And as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, Fortune is guiding our affairs better than we could have wished. Look over there, friend Sancho Panza, where more than 30 monstrous giants appear. I intend to do battle with them and take all of their lives. With their spoils, we will begin to get rich, for this is a fair war, and it is a great service to God to wipe such a wicked brood from the face of the earth. What giants, <laughs> asked Sancho Panza. There, those you see, replied his master, with their long arms. Some giants have them about six miles long. Take care, your worship, said Sancho. Those things over there are not giants, but windmills. And what seem to be their arms are the sails, which are whirled round in the wind and make the millstone turn. It is quite clear, replied Don Quixote, that you are not experienced in this matter of adventures. They are giants, 
And if you are afraid, go away and say your prayers whilst I advance and engage them in fierce and unequal battle. This is just hilarious. It, this is just so great. So, you know, off Sancho's master gallop to be utterly and foolishly unhorsed by an uncompromising windmill lifted up for a moment out of his saddle by the sail in this moment of flight and then crash back down to the hard ground. Now, <laughs> it's true. Don Quixote was acting there without a, a grasp on an immediate reality. But could it be that he was grasping at a higher reality? While Sancho may have thought that the whole affair was complete balderdash, could there be something beautiful here? Something folks like Sancho don't readily see. As G.K. Chesterton said uh, somewhere, <laughs> it is better to believe in the wrong thing than in nothing at all. After all, giants or their like are worth fighting. Chivalry and its like is worth preserving. The Knight of La Mancha saw giants looming over the land, and he knew that someone had to fight them because in a very real way, the windmills were not simply windmills. He saw them as mechanized industrial monsters, let us say, that stood to destroy the ideals of chivalry. And haven't they done just that? There is always a kernel of truth in Don Quixote's mad visions. But this is the thing. Don Quixote was a man of faith and farce. But he was not in the service of a fallacy or a false reality but rather a reality that wasn't immediately apparent because it was idealized. But that doesn't make it untrue. Quixote is mad, we may say, simply in his refusal to surrender the ideal or abandon his vision of beauty in an ugly world. And if that's madness, then maybe we should all subscribe to that kind of crazy we should all reach for that height, even if that means being hurled back down to earth all the time, again and again, because it's in those moments that we can define ourselves. Should we stay down, defeated, or rise up like the people of the resurrection that we are and keep on tilting at windmills? As madmen somehow manage to do, we may get others to share in our vision, which may not always remain as clear as they sometimes appear because we are fallen creatures in a fallen world. But if we make a few mistakes or suffer a few failures along the way, is that not forgivable? Are we not all weak and imperfect? And so, was there not something essentially real about the windmill tilt, misleading though it may have been in its accidents? Again, Don, Quixote, Don Quixote's ideals are no less right and true just because they cannot be fully realized. As every member of the church militant in the trenches of a godless society knows, derision must be faced, and fought. And frankly, you, sometimes you need to be a little nuts to do that. Uh, Don Quixote speaks the truth, even when the truth is unfashionable or uncomfortable or elusive. He strives to bring harmony to times of discord, even if it causes a little discord along the way. He points out giants where the world sees only, only windmills, and charges them, despite falls and scorn. He sees what he believes is hidden there, and is hidden there. 
and does what he holds by faith to be reasonable. But to a whole generation of plugged in neo pagans, devoted to the doctrine of relative truth and virtual reality, and to means rather than ends, the quest for objective truth and the ultimate end and all its beauty is totally delusional. And that's ironic because it's they themselves who don't have a grip on what's what at all. To them, the Catholic vision will invariably appear wilder or sillier than it has historically. Today, it is the Catholic who will be the one that appears disconnected from the way the world works, that he is the one stuck inside his head with no grasp of reality. And so what will be made of one who suddenly sounds a charge where no enemy is perceived? What will be made of any endeavor to remediate and rejuvenate those who are living disconnected from truth, cheapened by sensationalism, crippled by skepticism? What judgment awaits those who see something more than the visible and who take a stand for truth? Now, these are all <laughs> very challenging questions, I think. And they all turn around the idea that the good life is about charging after the highest truths, even if they are out of reach. And the road is beset with more snares and pitfalls, the more life becomes less about any kind of truth at all. The work to rebuild among the ruins is treacherous, as those who labor to restore Catholic culture can confirm but for those who wish to win truth, which requires bearing up under difficulty all the time, Don Quixote is the perfect hero, though he is admittedly a character that few might think of turning to for inspiration. When ends become frayed, crosses heavy, purposes blunted, or even broken. St. Paul writes, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Don Quixote may see things that are not visible, but only because he looks beyond the material manifestations of reality and to the symbolic side of things. And we should all seek a similar vision. Though it be through a glass darkly, <laughs> the struggle for restoration and truth and hope is a chivalric call to arms. And it is the Quixotic who heed that clarion call heard in the heart, regardless of what the tardy loiterers or high-powered executives of our age of irony have to say about it. And so what if they call us mindless, hopeless romantics? The thing is, Romance and reality are not mutually exclusive. Some think Don Quixote is just about irrational faith versus rational disbelief, but that just doesn't cut it. There is a romance that is appropriate to the real, and chivalry is not simply an irrational, nostalgic reminiscence that longs for escape and empty excitement. That being said, the seeming foolishness of the romantic, or Don Quixote, is not an end in itself. It's something to be separated from reason or reality. The romance of upholding the glory of what is past is not unrealistic, nor is it backwards looking, but rather it is a grasp of reality through acknowledgement of and love for those principles that are timeless, eternal, and that inform the present as they did in the past and will in the future, and they are worth engaging and not simply dreaming about. The romantic is, is actually very reasonable. 
ready and rearing to take action as he should in a world bursting with beauty and possibility. For he sees that the world is not unhappy and broken in reality. The pessimism that fragments reality is the falsehood. Creation is not divided, but unified. Don Quixote, the happy warrior with the sad face, <laughs> rides for the indomitable power of Catholic optimism, Catholic imagination, and the glorious Catholic craziness, if you will that perceives the highest realities in the lowliest realities. All that is to say is that Don Quixote is not only a man of great faith, but also, and paradoxically so, of great reason. Even though more often than not, he makes mistakes in his perceptions. He never acts without reason. Reason and faith being united and comically so for most of the book. Again, just to make my point clear, even when Don Quixote seems unreasonable or irrational, he always acts with right reason. Or at least, maybe a better way to put it, he always acts for the right reason. Though the circumstances don't always agree with his read of them, but his reason is there, together with his faith mad though he may appear. Don Quixote is an icon of modern Christian chivalry because he has dreams that are lofty and he believes in them and has good reasons to believe them, showing that the marriage of faith and reason can withstand the follies of fallen imperfect creatures even when they fail. Theodore Dostoevsky, um, who loved Don Quixote more than any other story, wrote about it in his diary, saying this. This saddest of all books, man will not forget to take along with him to the Lord's last judgment. He will point to the very deep and fatal mystery of man and of mankind revealed in it. He will show that the most sublime beauty of man, his loftiest purity, chastity, naivete, gentleness, and courage are often reduced to nothing with no benefit to mankind, solely because all these noblest and richest gifts with which man is frequently endowed have lacked one and final gift. Brilliant sanity in order to administer the wealth of these blessings and all their power, to administer and lead them along a truthful and not fantastic and insane path of action for the benefit of the human race." End quote. Though knighthood is extinct, that is no reason why chivalry should be dead. Don Quixote's anachronistic knighthood is a call for a renewed Catholic attitude when it comes to defying the world when the world is wrong and taking the risk of embracing rejected truths. This way of sudden perils, this straggling road in Spain up which a lean and foolish knight forever rides in vain, as G.K. Chesterton says in his poem Lepanto, is the Catholic quixotic challenge. These days, God knows, Catholics often feel bruised and even beaten. But if the world hate you, know ye that it hath hated me before you. Like Don Quixote and our Lord, all are called to sally forth undaunted, beating down discouragement, determined to be the challenger of mediocrity and the champion of sublimity. Catholics must learn to ride, even if it be in seeming vain, to tilt and be toppled 
for the truth. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, says St. Paul. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. It is never foolish to fight for the greater glory of God and in defense of the way, the truth, and the light. Miguel de Cervantes learned this in part from Don John of Austria, recognizing the heroism of one who ran the risk of failure to defend the sacred. Cervantes sensed a new breed of hero in the madcap Don John a hero whose heroism was new because it insisted upon old truths. Chesterton suggests in his poem that Cervantes saw in Don John the inspiration for Don Quixote. In turn, Don Quixote can be an inspiration for all of us as he charges, fights, falls, gets back up again in a beautiful allegory of the Catholic condition and thus of Catholic culture. Even to this day, Cervantes exhorts us all to stay strong when persecuted for the sake of righteousness, to do what heaven commands, even when the world condemns, to be conquered again and again, and to rise from the ashes again and again, and reach for the heights to come and see. All this is getting at the wonderful catechetical quality of Don Quixote's quest. And it goes beyond the conventional debates of the tale, such as why Cervantes' novel is considered the first modern novel, or whether Don Quixote is mad in a sane world or sane in a mad world, or what the intentions and identity of the Moorish narrator are. Forget, figuring everything out about Don Quixote is really not as essential as simply taking in the often misunderstood example that Don Quixote presents in his blundering gallantry in the name of chivalry and Catholic knighthood. It is beautiful to pursue the idyllic, but as long as men are flawed and society cynical, our vision can never be perfectly realized or even lasting, at least not on this side of God's grace. To conclude, being quixotic, being quixotic does not mean being quaint or cracked. It means being committed, committed to the ideals of reality to the highest realities and the intrinsic indissolubility of faith and reason. It means being a lover of lofty truth and being unafraid to suffer for it. It means enduring rejection while at the same time rejoicing in the joy of the journey even if it is up a Via Dolorosa. The Catholic Church needs a new knighthood of quixotic champions in this dour day and age. For though Catholicism may seem like madness in the context of secularism, it is the Catholic chivalric worldview that makes the world make the most sense and bestows a vision that is nothing less than a paradigm of sanity and sanctity. Thank you. Let's jump into question and answer here. Sean, I have, uh, of course, you know, a number of people asking, uh, because this is originally written in Spanish, do you have a particular um, translation that that you would prefer or recommend um <clears throat> sure 
Well, I've read three different translations. Um, I, uh, I'll give a long answer to a short question. Um, back, I can't remember what year it was. I gave uh, a year of my life to Don Quixote <laughs> in which I read three different translations. Um, and it was all uh, it was all mixed up or involved in a play that I wrote, um, which was uh, you know, taken from the novel, and we put it on here at St. Gregory's, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. We did a lot of uh, fun antics with the story. Uh, you know, for instance, Don Quixote, we uh, we made his armor, his cuirass, out of a, gar a garbage can, you know, and cutting a hole out of it just to sh make him look like a complete idiot and. Uh, and he and Sancho Panza rode on unicycles that had a horse's head and a donkey's head attached to them. So they looked like these clowns as they were riding these unicycle animals and wearing <laughs> trash. And uh, in any case, I read three different translations, which were sort of the, the translations that two of which were recommended to me. Um, one was by... Uh, let's see, a translator named John Rutherford. John Rutherford. That is sort of the translation that is considered the most elegant, I think you might say. And then another translation by Edith Grossman. That translation is considered to be the closest to the Spanish. And then, <laughs> and then this one, um, this, this, and this is my favorite one. Um, this is translated by J.M. Cohen. And I don't know why, I don't know why it's, uh, I don't know what to say about it, except that I prefer it. <laughs> and uh, this is just a, 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 a humble little Barnes and Noble copy, but J.M. Cohen, I read J.M. Cohen's translation uh, at the side by side with Rutherford and Grossman and I preferred it so I recommend the Cohen how about that excellent well that's reason enough to pick up that uh, that version for those of you who are on the fence um, a couple of questions then kind of related to that uh, and and I'll just kind of smash some of these together just talking about you know what to read along with it Victoire asks if you recommend a companion book uh, to reading this work, maybe a, a piece of criticism or something like that to help guide you. And then somebody else wrote in asking uh, if there were any writings that you're aware of um, about Don Quixote that m were contemporary to Cervantes, maybe any criticism from his own time. Would you, what 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 might you recommend along those lines? Right. Um, as far as uh, criticism, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read very much criticism. I've read a lot of essays. Um, Chesterton has a, has a short novel called The Return of Don Quixote, which is interesting and in itself is a kind of, it's a kind of criticism uh, or interpretation of the novel in a modern context. And, and that, that book is a lot of fun. Um, as far as contemporaries of Cervantes, I am so sorry, I'm not that good. <laughs> I, do, I have no recommendations. <laughs> Shakespeare, <laughs> but no, he's not Spanish, but they were contemporaries, obviously. You know, the, when part, Don Quixote Part One was published in the same year that King Lear was published, which is again they died on the same day, and then they both published their their stories about mad old men at the in the same year. So that's uh, that's all I have to say. But yeah, sorry, a good question, and uh, I'm sorry that I don't have a satisfactory response. Diane asks uh, if you could comment on how the Catholic Church received the book at the time. Uh, she says, I've understood that Don Quixote caused some pushback. Uh, for example, in the tale, uh, he, he, he talks about using shirt tails to wrap a Bible. Uh, anything on this? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember that episode exactly. I do know that the counts that when Cervantes, part of Cervantes's motivation for writing Don Quixote was because, um, one of the edicts or uh, from the Council of Trent was to exhort artists, Catholic artists and writers to promote the faith more purposefully and aggressively in their work. Um, and, and with regard to literature, it was you know, part of the, the, the council's intention to kind of pull people away from 
this, uh, this foolishness, this kind of drivel that they were reading, and which was often uh, highly immoral as well, um, you know, appealing to uh, base appetites and, and whatnot. So it, he did, Cervantes did write Don Quixote sort of in the wake of that exhortation from the Council of Trent. And it's, it's very clear that he intends to teach Catholic principles, Catholic history, theology in the book. Don Quixote is always stopping and giving little sermons. And Sancho is always complaining how he, he makes a better preacher than a knight. <laughs> um, so he definitely used Don Quixote as a kind of vehicle to express truths of the church and to give some, some, uh, to give some uh, attention to the importance of the Battle of Lepanto. You know, Don Quixote meets a soldier in an inn somewhere that was at the battle and you sort of get a first hand in a way from Cervantes, a first hand account of the battle there. Um, but I've never heard of the church um, taking the same line of criticism or having the same issues with Don Quixote. And it was a very popular book in its day, um, as it did with the works of romance that it was trying to supplant. So that's my answer there. Kind of related to that question too. So another one coming in, uh, this person says, what would you say to those critics today uh, who allege that Cervantes had to be an agnostic or even a closet atheist uh, who was making jabs at the vestiges of medieval Christianity? I mean, obviously the entire presentation that you just gave, just kind of arguing against that, but but that is where uh, where modern academia are taking the book. So how would you kind of address that main criticism? Right. Yeah, I guess you could see, um, you know, it's it's a complex book and uh, part of its complexity and part of its its um, difficulty is that it can be, you can argue many different angles pretty effectively on it. Um, and so, so I can see how people would say that Cervantes was uh, a cynic um, and he was just mocking this because he thought it was all foolish and all of this religion that Don Quixote is spouting is nonsense, um, just, to, just to make fun of it and to deride it, um, or, to, or to find his own, his own way through all of that if he, if he was agnostic. There, even though the history of Cervantes' life is somewhat scant and scattered, one area that historians seem to agree is that he was Catholic. He was a devout Catholic. Um, and so when you see that in Don Quixote, when you see Don Quixote speaking uh, very, uh, with, with, with a lot of knowledge about theology and what the church teaches, uh, the importance of grace and, and salvation, um, it's hard to think, it's hard to see, even though he's, Cervantes puts that in a ridiculous figure, it's done in moments where Don Quixote is admirable, admirable. Um, it's one of those, one of those moments of, that, that get at this dichotomy where he, Don Quixote is so foolish at one moment when it's mostly in action. He charges the sheep thinking that they're soldiers and gets trampled or, or all of these different things. But then when he stops and looks back on his adventure and commends himself to God and says his prayers and say, this is what we're doing. We're here to rid the world of, of evil and injustice. There's just so much truth and authenticity in it. And it's so moving. It's, it's hard to see it as, um, as just cynical. I guess I, I think that if Cervantes was just a cynic or a skeptic, he would have done a better job because, with Don Quixote because he's a good writer. And he would have made that a, a little bit clearer instead of making a very, what seems to me, a very clear statement of, well, Don Quixote tells the truth and he understands the truth, but he just fails in accomplishing it. Um, he makes a lot of mistakes and you should have pity on him and relate to him because if you... We have the truth too, but we're we're going to fail in living according to its dictates as well. Um, 
and the ending of the book, you know, I, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to bring in the ending because the ending is so great and I am determined not to spoil it, but it's very difficult for me to think of Cervantes just intending to question aggressively or take down the chivalric Catholic purpose in lieu of the ending which is so beautiful and so sublime and so heartbreaking but you're just going to have to read it and it's hard i mean the book is a thousand pages long and it's a slog and it's you know as as a book that's um imitating and parodying the the romances of the day it's extremely episodic and 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 kind of repetitive you know he knows his audience and he's he's delivering material that they'll be able to navigate pretty well uh, although they're finding new material in it. Um, but the form is very similar. But even in writing a book that is so long and at times wearisome, it's like, I can't believe this guy lost a, yet another tooth and cracked another rib. And shouldn't this horse be dead by now? I mean, that's being held up by sticks as they're going down the road. But I think that even in the length and the, the repetition, Cervantes is kind of saying he's making a, a statement of faith in that saying you think this book is hard to read yeah i know i mean try living life you know you just have to keep going through the same old stuff you go to confession you confess the same old sins but you just got to keep getting up and facing the same challenges turn the same pages over and over reading episodes that are very similar and it's a challenge don quixote is a challenge to read absolutely but in that challenge is, I don't know, it, it, in that in the challenge of reading the book exists a kind of symbol or allegory of the challenge of the Catholic life. Um, and I think that's, that, that seems pretty unmistakable to me, that he's playing with that and trying to test our resolve as Catholics <laughs> in reading this book. It's like, are you getting tired of this already? Well, what's going to happen to you when you go out in the real world? Um, so, it can be a problematic book because of its, uh, it as a great book, as one of the great works, you know, a characteristic of, of a great work is that it, it can stand up to all sorts of interpretation. Um, but Cervantes's own faith and the words that he puts on the page, you know, it's one thing to, to look at Hamlet and say, well, this could really mean this or that <laughs> or something else. You know, Hamlet is totally enigmatic. Um, you could end, but with Don Quixote, there's less enigma once, you know, in the words. And once you kind of get, you, you get the joke that Cervantes is making is that this is a guy that is trying really hard to do the right thing, but he's just messing up every single time but he's not giving up it's hard for me to, it, it, and maybe my my interpretation is, is biased at this point but it's hard for me to think of that as critical or mocking on his part as it is trying to paint a picture of the human condition that was a great answer. Thank you uh, very much. We'll we'll wrap it up there. Uh, but I, we did get somebody writing in asking they they have a keen eye, uh, asking about the Don Quixote artwork behind you. Could you say something real quick? Like, right. is it that that black and white one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a large uh, picture of Don Quixote in his library. Um, it's by um, Gustave Doré. Gustave Doré. Don Quixote. May, he's he was a great. Um, you know, 19th century illustrator. Um, he did wood burnings. Don Quixote is perhaps his most famous work. If not Don Quixote, it's the Divine Comedy. And, you know, regarding translations, I mean, it's translated from the Spanish, which isn't particularly a, a tricky language. Um, but if you can get a copy of Don Quixote with the Dore illustrations, the translation doesn't matter. So <laughs> that's a large picture of Don Quixote in his library with all sorts of fantastic knights and beasts and horses and ladies sort of leaping out of the woodwork. Um, yeah, it, that's, that's worth, you know, scrolling through uh, an image search. The, the, the Dore illustrations 
for Don Quixote, they are unparalleled. Very cool. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick. It's been an absolutely wonderful night. Really a lot of fun spending time together as, a, as an ICC family learning from you. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you for the first time. We hope to have you back again uh, to talk about maybe some other great work because um, it, uh, it, it was really excellent. So thank you from everybody here still with us who made it to the, the bitter end. Uh, we still have a couple hundred people with us tonight uh, who really appreciate it. I know they're all, they're all muted behind the screens, but uh, on their behalf, of course, I just want to thank you for uh, for your time and energy uh, and preparation in order to spend time with us this evening, Sean. Uh, could you perhaps close us in a, a short prayer this evening? That would be wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to everyone. I had a wonderful time. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you all. We'll uh, say uh, the prayer to St. Michael. That seems fitting. Name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen.